Welcome to this third and final talk in our series about the Kingdom of God. My name is Don, I'm a member of the Christadelphians who meet at Rugby. The theme of our three talks is the Kingdom, the coming, God's coming Kingdom. And this is a basic Bible subject. Uh, on the first talk in our series, Mark spoke on world history in a dream. And he took us through the fascinating dream that is recorded in Daniel chapter 2, when the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream, and Daniel was able to interpret it and show to the king Nebuchadnezzar that mighty though his kingdom was, and there will be other kingdoms that will follow his, but ultimately it was God's plan to establish God's kingdom upon the earth with the Lord Jesus as its king. And in our second talk, Tequin took us through uh, the theme of Israel, God's kingdom, past and future, to show that God's kingdom did exist in the past, in the times of the kings of Israel, in the times of David and Solomon, but came to an end because of the wickedness of the kings of Israel. But God promised that one day that kingdom will be restored and the one whose right it is would come back to this earth and to rule for God in his kingdom. So that brings us to this third talk. I'm very pleased to have Luke with us and he's going to talk about the kingdom of God is like, and he's going to look at various passages which tell us what this coming kingdom is going to be like. So it's a very exciting subject and a very fitting conclusion to this short series of talks. So to introduce his remarks, we're going to take a reading from the prophet Isaiah and the 35th chapter. And I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. So Isaiah chapter 35 gives us this wonderful picture of God's coming kingdom. The wilderness on the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. Strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are faint-hearted, fearful-hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall weep like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For waters shall burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty lands springs of water. The habitation of jackals, where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and a road, and it shall be called the Highway of Holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast go upon it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return, and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So with that wonderful passage from Isaiah chapter 35, I'll now hand over to Luke to tell us what the kingdom of God 
is going to be really like Luke. It's lovely to be able to be with you and to share some thoughts on this subject. Um, the kingdom of God is like. Now, it's, um, as you might be able to perceive from the dots there, the subject is, is, is actually a, a reference to a, a passage <clears throat> or multiple passages that, that speak about the kingdom of God. Um, and we're going to uh, have a look at that later in our remarks and uh, sort of see, see what the Bible has to say in this respect. But we want to um, work our way through to that point by, by um, looking at a, at a few things first. And we'd like to start off by just setting some um, basic principles to start off with, just to kind of frame, frame our remarks. Um, first of all, we want to um, be really clear that the Bible is God's proven word. Now, it's not our uh, subject this evening to, to uh, prove that. We haven't got the time. It's a, it's a, a topic in its own right. Um, but this is something that we are um, able to, to do on other occasions. The Bible is, is, is something that can be demonstrably shown to be the word of a divine creator. And we can have the utmost confidence in that. But for the purposes of our remarks um, today, um, we, we just like to sort of take, take that as read, um, but it's an important principle. Secondly, and this is referring back to the, uh, the talk we've already had in this series, as, as, as Don mentioned in his introduction, um, the Bible um, describes the coming kingdom of God on earth. It's uh, full of uh, references to this, to this coming kingdom. And uh, by way of example, we, we don't need to turn it up, but in, in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, uh, we find a verse that uh, is in the context of that uh, world history in a dream that we looked at um, previously. Um, and it, it, it demonstrates that um, this, this kingdom uh, is going to come and replace all kingdoms that have come before it. It's, it's a future kingdom that will replace all those that have gone before. So, so that's our second principle. Our third one, we will have a look at this one. It's in the Gospel record of Luke and chapter one. And this is the principle that the kingdom of God that we're talking about is going to be ruled over by the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's have a look at Luke chapter one and read from verse 31. These are words of the angel to Mary. And they go as follows. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. So we have here um, an unequivocal link between the Lord Jesus Christ and an everlasting kingdom. So this is showing us, and it can be supported by passages elsewhere, that, that the, the kingdom of God, the kingdom that we've been talking about throughout this series, described there as um, the house of Jacob, Jacob is another name for Israel, is, is going to be ruled over by the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's a kingdom that will never end. So that's, that's our, our third principle. And then our fourth principle is, is when will this kingdom start? Well, let's go to the book of Acts in chapter one and have a look at uh, a few verses there. This is the time that the Lord Jesus Christ left the earth. He ascended to heaven and he's asked a question by some of his disciples who had accompanied him when he... Um, uh, set out on this final journey before departing and we read in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6 therefore when they had come together this is Jesus and his disciples they the disciples asked him Jesus saying Lord will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel so these disciples understood that Jesus was going to be the king over this kingdom of Israel and they were asking him are you going to set about establishing that kingdom now? And he said to them, he didn't say, what are you talking about? He didn't say, you're wrong. I'm not going to rule over a kingdom. He said, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you 
and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. He's talking to them about the work that they were going to have to do um, before um, uh, this kingdom was going to be established and that he, he couldn't tell them the time that the kingdom was going to be established. And the key point really, verse nine, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So what we're being told here is that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back to the earth. He left it, but he's going to come back. And that tied in with the setting up of the kingdom, this kingdom which is going to be everlasting, a kingdom that's associated with Israel, all points towards this kingdom starting when the Lord Jesus comes back to the earth. I say starting, really, it's, it's a resumption, isn't it? As we looked at last time, this is the continuation of the kingdom of Israel. So really, it's a case of the kingdom being restored and resuming, but this time with Jesus as its head. So <clears throat> that's the, um, the fourth principle we kind of wanted to, to set out um, at the start, just so that we're all really clear that this is a future kingdom to be ruled over by Jesus here on the earth. So now let's start to think a bit more about that kingdom. In fact, let's think more broadly. Let's just think about the idea of, of government, because a kingdom is a form of a government, isn't it? Uh, we live in the uh, United Kingdom, and uh, many, many uh, years ago, we used to be ruled over by the king, until, of course, the power of the monarchy came to an end and was replaced with a parliament. I'm sure we've all uh, familiar with the events from, from, our, from our history lessons. And um, the important principle there was that, that the people didn't want to be ruled over uh, by, by, by a monarch. They wanted to have the opportunity to, to um, choose who governed them. And, and of course, across the, across the world, we see in, in, in many, if not most countries of the world, we see governments that are ruled over by um, elected representatives. And, and this is, of course, you know, it's democracy, isn't it? Uh, a, a theme that's been all too familiar um, over the last, well, 12 months, really. 12 months ago, um, we, we, we saw the um, UK election, which was uh, uh, a very um, at the forefront of the, of the news for, for, for quite a period of time. Uh, and then, of course, more recently, we've had the US election, which has dominated the news cycle for, for a long time. And, uh, and, and this form of government is held up as, as the best, isn't it? This is the, the best way for, for um, mankind to be governed. And, and you may remember a few years back when there was the Arab Spring and all these sort of uh, Middle Eastern uh, nations that had been previously ruled over in an undemocratic way um, were, were being, the, 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 the governments were being overthrown and replaced with with new democratic governments, um, which was the, 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 the real theme of, of that period of time. Um, we won't particularly comment on how that, how that worked out, but, but it was certainly, a, 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 you know, for a period of a few years, a real dominant theme about how all these people being liberated from oppressive regimes and had the opportunity, um, they thought at least, to be, to be ruled over by democratically elected governors. So, so democracy then, the casting of votes by the people to choose how they are governed is, 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 is seen as being this, this gold standard of, of, of government. Um, but let's just think about that a little bit. So <clears throat> you may recall there were Belarusian presidential elections not so long ago. And um, ever since there have been protests in Belarus against what they believe to be a rigged result. The opposition were treated unfairly, the vote was rigged, etc., and um, the people don't believe that the president was was fairly elected; that he rightfully had the majority vote of his population. So that apparently is democracy. There was a vote; people voted. But but is it really democracy? Um, we're not going to comment on the politics of it, but but certainly the impression that we're given from from the protests that we see is that the elections were generally perceived not to have been fair and democratic. So the system of democracy doesn't seem to have worked particularly well there. What about Hong Kong? 
So when Hong Kong was handed over to, to China from, from Britain uh, back in the, in the 90s, um, there were some really clear principles set out that they were to maintain a degree of, uh, of um, uh, rights and liberties uh, and a form of democracy that the mainland China wasn't entitled to. And that was really set out in law and principle and, and something that was a essential part of that deal. But as we've seen over a number of years, culminating this year in, in the, the, the tightest clampdown um, ever uh, in Hong Kong, that democracy hasn't unfolded the way that was anticipated. And the people feel that increasingly their rights and their liberties have been taken away from them. So is, is that really democracy, what we see happening in Hong Kong? It's supposed to be, it's what it says on the tin, but, but is that really what's happening? Is this really this wonderful form of government in action? And of course, we've already alluded to it, but the US election. Now, people might quite confidently say, Joe Biden has uh, won the majority votes and the majority number of states and is quite rightfully elected president, notwithstanding any uh, claims made to the contrary. But when we look at the bitterness and the division and the actions and the counteractions that have taken place over this election period, and, and to be frank, haven't yet concluded, it's far from, from uh, you know, the transition point is far from here, isn't it? There's still a way to go. Is this democracy? And, and if it is, is, is this an honourable way to run a country, the, the, the things that we have seen? Um, the, the, there have been all kinds of bitter tastes left in mouths and, and questions about, about the US electoral system. And there's been commentary from countries like, like Russia um, and China who are sort of you know, looking scornfully at America for, for the way it's allowed itself to be governed. And we have to ask ourselves, is, is this really democracy? Or if it is, is that the kind of government that, that we all treasure and, and value? And there's quite a good quote by, by the author, Robert Byrne, who says, democracy is being allowed to vote for the candidate you dislike least. I think that's been quite a, uh, an element of, of the US election, hasn't it? That, that really the choice of Trump and Biden is, is far from a great choice for many people. Again, we're not gonna comment on the politics particularly, but the fact that there was no obvious candidate that, that could command the vast majority of the population is, is an indication that um, you know, many, many people, even those who voted for the eventual winner, will not have somebody governing them that aligns as well as they would like with, with what they believe to be um, right and proper. And, and in fact, the previous election that Donald Trump won, he won without having the popular vote. More people across the country voted for Hillary Clinton, but the way the system works, he became president. And, and finally, before we, we move on from this, um, this has been the most incredible of years, not, not in a particularly good way. Um, it's been dominated by, by the lockdown, the pandemic, um, but also by, by protests, hasn't it? There've been all kinds of protests. There's been protests against the lockdown, protests against vaccines, and of course, protests against governments and organizations around civil liberties. And um, I certainly can't remember uh, for many, many years, the same degree of civil unrest as there has been this year. I'm sure in, in many uh, years gone by, you know, when there have been other civil rights movements, um, there have been clearly some, some big uh, outbreaks of protest. But certainly in recent history, um, what we've witnessed over this year has been a step change from, from, from recent years. There's been more division, more unhappiness, more polarizing of views, more resistance to governors and governments that were democratically elected. And, and, and even though the US now has a new government, so it would seem, we all know that in four years or eight years, there will be campaigns for change because that always happens uh, when, a, when an election comes along. There's always complaints about how a country is governed and calls for, for changes to that. And we look at how Donald Trump became elected on the back of Obama who came in with this you know, wonderful yes we can type of message um, but yet look at the swing from from Obama to Trump at that change it just highlights all of this really that, that democracy is a bit of a fallacy that it's it's supposedly the best form of government but, but actually 
it's it's full of flaws it's full of problems um you don't really get what you think you get and and it's far from this ideal standard um and and perfect outcome and, and many would say it's not meant to be perfect it's meant to be um you know it's meant to do a job and um you know it does that job but hopefully we've demonstrated that there's got to be surely <laughs> ways uh, that, that, that 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 governments are formed could could be better than what we what we tend to see with, with democracy now in saying that of course when we think about the other end of the spectrum uh, leaders who have no um uh, elected mandate um thinking of dictators by definition uh, a dictator is a ruler who does not rule through democratic means it's not a great set of people is it we think of stalin we think of hitler pol pot or mao these are not people held up in history as great leaders are they these are these are people that have performed some terrible atrocities so the the other end of the spectrum from democracy is is full of horrific stories abuses and 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 actions so so actually for all of its flaws um it can be said of democracy and indeed was said by Winston Churchill that democracy is the worst form of government except all the others that have been tried. So, so the most common and seemingly popular form of government is, is really, you know, it, it's only popular and common because it's better than even worse forms of government, not because it's intrinsically brilliant in its own right. So, so why is this? Why is it that, that you know, the, the best form of government that, that's been tried is still so full of flaws? Well, the Bible gives us an explanation for this. Let's go to Psalm 146. And a uh, reading from, from verse 3 of Psalm 146. Bear with me, just turn the wrong one up. Psalm 146 and verse 3, do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth in that very day, his plans perish. So we're told there, in no uncertain terms, do not trust in mankind. Don't put your trust in man. There's no help there. Man does not have answers to the big problems. And that's evidently seen, isn't it, by the fact that every time a new government is elected, it's on a mandate of change because what went before wasn't working. And yet their new mandate of change in a few years time is thrown out because it's not working. And we see this with the big issues of the day, climate change and, uh, and, and, and coronavirus pandemics, which, OK, it seems like we're making good progress with vaccines and all the rest of it. But, but history shows that on these really, really big problems, you know, there are no perfect or quick or, or, or um, ideal solutions and um, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll get past the pandemic and, and it'll all be consigned to history but but it won't have been without leaving massive uh, trail of destruction in its wake so, so that's why um, anything that's determined by man is doomed to failure because man frankly uh, is unable to uh, to act uh, in a reliable fashion we can't trust in mankind however, by contrast, reading on in this psalm, verse 5, happy is he who has the God of Jacob, or Israel, for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. That's, that's, that's a stark contrast, isn't it? We can't put our trust in man, but we can hope, we can trust, we can find help in God. Because he's the creator and he's therefore capable of all things. And look at that long list of things he's capable of, of justice, of giving food to the hungry, freedom to prisoners, opening the eyes of the blind, healing and, and restoring. 
watching over the strangers, the fatherless and the widows. So a, a remarkable list of characteristics that any government would give its right arm to be able to say they could do. So, so here we have a real contrast between the government of man and what God is capable of. And this really gives us our framework for the kingdom of God, because we've just seen here, essentially, God's manifesto. This is what he is capable of. This is what a government that's ruled by him would be like. So let's think about that a bit more then and just just build on that. Um, and we'd like to just spend a bit of time in the book of Isaiah. There's a lot in the book of Isaiah that's relevant to our, our topic and we can't spend too long diving in, um, but, but hopefully we can get a good flavour flavor from it. Let's have a look at Isaiah chapter 11 and read the first, first part of that chapter. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall go out of his roots. Now, it might not jump out, but that verse is talking about Jesus, because Jesus, we saw from the passage in Luke, was the son of David. David's father was Jesse. So this is a slightly poetic way of referring to a descendant of Jesse, i.e. a descendant of David, i.e. the Lord Jesus Christ. So we, we've seen, haven't we, that uh, God's characteristics and capabilities um, from, from that previous passage now let's read on about Jesus in this chapter. Verse two, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. So, so that, that's a, a list of characteristics that's pretty much in line with what we saw from, from that psalm, isn't it? And it's not surprising, because what we're seeing is Jesus is able to perfectly reflect the characteristics of God, the spirit of God, rests upon him. So whilst God as the creator is capable of all these remarkable accomplishments in, in, in transforming um, problems and restoring things and, and fixing things, Jesus as his son is exactly the same. He, as a ruler, would rule in exactly that way, in a way that no president or prime minister of today would come close to, not judging by by what he sees or hears, but by what he knows through the spirit of God with righteousness. So what we're seeing here is that although God is the ultimate ruler, it is through his son that he will actually put into practice his manifesto, if you like. And let's just read on from verse six where we stop. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fattening together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So this, this beautiful passage is describing a state of affairs that, that we couldn't imagine existing today, with, with, with animals that would not play nicely together. You know, a wolf and a lamb where, where you know, under normal circumstances, uh, one would kill the other, um, <clears throat> but not here. And what this is showing us is this, this rule of the Lord Jesus will involve a coming together of, of animals, people that, that previously would never have been able to come together, uh, a unifying, uh, a peacefulness, a collaboration. There, there, there's no hurting or destroying in this time of Jesus's rule. It's a remarkable thing, isn't it, to, to think about. The sort of thing that no government of today or government in waiting could, could even think to put in a manifesto because they'd have absolutely no way of even coming close to delivering that kind of environment. 
So there's some, some remarkable things there. Let, let's go towards the end of Isaiah and, and have a look at chapter 65. And just read from, from that chapter. So it's Isaiah 65, and let's pick it up from, from verse 17. <clears throat> For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. So there's a clear break here in, in affairs, isn't there? There's a new heavens and a new earth. This is something new. A new creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That was the physical uh, environment. And here we have a new heavens and a new earth. So there's some almost hit the reset button and start over uh, type of thing. Verse 18, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. As the days of a tree, so shall the days of my people, so shall be the days of my people, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labour in vain, nor bring forth children for treble, for they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. See some echoes there from that 11th chapter, the wolf and the lamb, not hurting or destroying. But, but building on that and giving us an even greater picture of what a new heavens and earth, a new um, order, if you like, uh, under the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ would bring us. Let, let's just, just kind of recap. Back over that. So, so we've got this sense of, of justice, haven't we? This, this, this wonderful justice. There's no building and another inhabiting. You know, there's no kind of capitalist taking advantage of people to make the rich richer and the poor poorer. There's no governing and ruling with eyes and ears and having to take the most convincing legal arguments, even if the actual um, event is a, a miscarriage of justice. You know, it's often the case that the person with the deepest legal pockets will win whether or not they are uh, uh, innocent. So, so there's this wonderful justice, this righteousness, this equity from, from the reign of the Lord Jesus, something that, that we, we just don't come close to in today's society. There's, there's a peace. There's this idea about planting vineyards and, and, um, and, 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 and the wolf and the lamb, you know, uh, traditional hostilities set aside. People can, can get on with people in a way that was never possible before. Food. There are so many parts of the world where there are chronic food shortages, even in this country, where, you know, we're supposedly a, a, a reasonably well-off nation. There are people in food poverty, children who, who, who can't get meals. And, and there's, there's been recent campaigns around uh, funding them for, 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 for free school meals. But, but there's no shortage of food here. There's, there's, there's sufficient to, to go around. There's shelter. People have homes. They're not homeless. People have, have a source of, of um, uh, they have what they need to live. They, 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 they don't go without their food on the table or the roof over their heads. Health is transformed. There's the, 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 the number of, many, many numbers of reasons that, that people will die prematurely, whether it's a, a disease, just look at coronavirus, uh, whether it's a, a particular uh, accident that might occur to them. Um, there are many reasons why people die before their time, but here health and life expectancy are transformed. It says the child will die a hundred years old. It's incredible, isn't it? And, and again, that sense that, that there is no sorrow, there's no hurt or destroy, uh, no hurt or destruction. There's a removal of, of the, the, the distresses and the griefs that are experienced today. It's marvellous, isn't it? 
And um, this isn't just a case that these things are taken out for those people from that point onwards. But we read in that opening chapter, didn't we, from Isaiah 35, we're not going to have another look at it, but hopefully you'll recall what was said, that, that the wonderful sense of restoration of the, of the blind seeing, of the, the lame leaping, of, of pools of water in the parched desert, a real strong sense of, of change and transformation to the things that exist into completely different um, entities. And this is the sort of thing that, that, that governments of, of man today could only dream of doing. We, 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 you know, we're struggling at the moment on, on multiple fronts just to, to keep our heads above water as a society, with the economy, with health, with, with school meals and, and, and all these other challenges that we face. And, and yet the sorts of transformations being described here are just so far out of reach for, for today's governments. But God can bring them about through his son. So it's a, hopefully a wonderful picture emerging from these and other passages of, of what this rule of Jesus in his kingdom would, would be like. But, but there's another um, couple of points. Um, notice as we've read through that, and perhaps whilst we're in Isaiah, we'll go back to the second chapter. The references again to Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, to the God of Israel, to, to Jesus as the son of David, who was um, of the house of Israel. There's repeated references to this nation. And if we come back to Isaiah chapter two, we have some words which might be familiar even to those who aren't as well versed in the Bible. Um, <clears throat> Isaiah two and verse two, it shall come to pass in the latter days. So it's talking about a, an end time. And we've talked about the return of Jesus being in the future. So this is talking about that future time. The mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob or Israel. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they learn war anymore. So here we're seeing some similar sentiments of this time. It's clear that it's talking about the same time period, this, this time of peace instead of war. And notice that this is a time, remember those verses in the other chapters, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Well, we're talking about mountains here, aren't we? These are the mountains of Israel. We're talking about a seat of government that's in Israel, in Jerusalem, from which the law of God goes out and to which all nations come to worship and to recognize the authority and power of, of Jesus on behalf of his father. And it's from there that Jesus will judge between the nations and execute this, this, this rulership. This is a kingdom that has Israel, the people of God, at its very center. And that's a really important principle. Um, that for all their faults that we might perceive today, they are a secular nation today. In this time period, they are going to be at the heart of the kingdom of God. It's the territory of Israel will be where that kingdom is based, even though its, its reach will be throughout the whole world. All nations will come up and be subject to that rulership of the Lord Jesus. And there's, there's, there's one more thing as well. And let's go to the book of Revelation. We've talked about a wonderful transformation, a complete change to the state of affairs we know today. And when we come to Revelation chapter 21 and we read from the beginning, we see another reference to a new heaven and a new earth. It's again talking about this time of change, this kingdom that's come about to replace the first heaven and the first earth, which is now passed away. And verse two, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. This is now a vision. It's a figurative language, but it's using the language of, of Israel and Jerusalem. I saw the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So we talked about Jesus coming back from heaven to the earth to set up this kingdom. We have the same picture of God's kingdom coming to earth from the heavens. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. 
and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. This is the most remarkable thing about this kingdom of, 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 of God, is that it's going to be a time when death itself will cease. Now, we could spend some time looking at the nuances of that, and, 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 and it's not the case that from the point Jesus returns, nobody will ever die. But there is a sense whereby death is taken away from the earth. So it's, it, it's, it's no longer the problem that it was. And, and eventually, over time, there will be never again another death. So, so this is something that, that however popular and effective a government of today might be, there's no way they could prevent death from occurring. They might be able to extend life. There may be some high um, technology ideas around how we can change ourselves from humans to robots and live on in that sort of a way. But it's all science fiction, isn't it? That's, that's far from, from being um, brought to reality. Here we're seeing that this rule of Jesus on behalf of his father is a time when, as well as sorrow and, and, and tears and crying, death itself will will cease. So this all sounds marvellous. Great. Bring it on. Can't wait. But we can't stop there because there's a really important principle we need to finish on. And that's the fact that this wonderful prospect of living in a kingdom like this does come with a, a bit of a string attached. Let's go to the book of Matthew in chapter 25. We're not going to read this whole passage because we don't, don't have the time, but we're reading about the Lord Jesus again when he comes in verse 31, coming in his glory and sitting on the throne of his glory. So this is put us squarely in that time period of his kingdom. And we read about all the nations being gathered before him and he'll separate them one from another like a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. So we've read about him judging righteously already. So here he is judging righteously and he puts the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. And he says to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me, sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. So Jesus turns to not everybody, but those he's put on his right hand and said, this kingdom is for you. And they sort of asked him, well, you know, when did we give you food and did all these things? And his answer to them was, um, verse 40, I say to you, in as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So the way you behaved with your brothers, your sisters, your neighbours, you were by extension doing that to me. And because you treated them well and you lived your life in the way that was expected of you, you get to inherit this kingdom. What about those on his left hand, the ones termed goats? When he says to them, verse 41, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food, thirsty and you gave me no drink. And they asked him, when was this? And he said, the same as he said to those on his right hand, it's the way you treated your brothers and your sisters, those around you. You were treating me just as badly. And in the end, verse 46, these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So we're seeing here that this kingdom has not quite universal application, has it? It's, it's being offered to those who have lived a life that's expected of them, who have obeyed the commandments of God. That's why things like death, they don't disappear altogether because it's, it's offered to those who have um, been considered by Jesus to have lived faithful lives, they are the ones that will receive these rewards and the, the full benefits of, of this kingdom age. And we're not going to go into the details of it now, um, but there, there will be uh, a section of society that, that lives on, nations that live on, um, who, who haven't fully accepted Jesus at this point. Um, and, and, and they will still be subject to certain things like, like death, but, but, but in a much greater environment than the one that we see today the full benefits of this kingdom the full extent of these wonderful blessings is offered to those who have followed jesus and obeyed these commandments 
And that brings us really round to Matthew chapter 13, which we're not going to, to look at in any detail. But remember, we said at the outset, this phrase, the kingdom of God is like, is, 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 is something we find in the scriptures. Um, it's in this chapter. It's actually described as the kingdom of heaven, um, but, but, but it's talking about the same kingdom, the kingdom that is heavenly, the kingdom that Jesus brings, comes down from heaven to set up. And we see it referenced a few times in this chapter. Um, we see in verse 24, Jesus is talking in parables, telling stories, and he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Verse 31, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Verse 33, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. Verse 44, um, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. Verse 45, it's like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. Verse 47, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind. And verse 52, the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Now, we're seeing quite a different form of um, concept here, aren't we? The kingdom of God, we're not being told what's it like to live in the kingdom. We're being sort of told what does the kingdom of God mean to you? How do you achieve a place in this kingdom is essentially what we might say so for example if we just pick the example in verse uh, 45 of the the pearl the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it so this is telling us something about the kingdom here the kingdom of god should be like a pearl that we would spend every last penny to obtain now okay a pearl might be of no interest to us, but think about those things that mean so much to us. Our children, for example, you know, what parent wouldn't um, lay their life on the line for their child? What are the things in our lives that mean the most to us? And what this is saying is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven should be like that. It should be to us the equivalent of the most amazing pearl to the most passionate pearl merchant. That's how we should perceive the kingdom. The kingdom of God is like, and it lists a few of these, and I would encourage you to go and read Matthew 13 at your leisure to understand these parables and these stories that Jesus is telling, because they each come with a bit of a lesson. This isn't telling us the kingdom of God is like peacefulness and, 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 and food restored and, and the kind of stuff we've looked at so far. There are real lessons here for us that we can put into practice in how we perceive and respond to this kingdom. It's perhaps best summed up by another verse in Matthew, Matthew 6, verse 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We need to seek this first above everything else in our lives. It's the most critical thing for us to seek because it's only if we seek it with such passion and commitment that we can be amongst those that Jesus considers a sheep on his right hand who are worth, uh, worthy of inheriting that kingdom and all of the benefits that come with it. So, to conclude then by way of summary hopefully what we've seen um, through through this uh, consideration today is that society is, is, is in desperate need of of a of a better form of government that the ones that we have today just just don't come close to, to to solving life's problems and to giving people what they need we've seen that jesus's return with god's kingdom will bring permanent and positive change change that's so beyond the reach of mankind and the world will be transformed forever but only believers only those who follow jesus who obey his commandments who treat their neighbors as as, as if we were responding to jesus himself only they will get the full benefits and so the call to you the call of action of the scriptures is look into these things for yourself understand what's expected of you and if you do that, and if you can truly be a believer and a follower of Jesus, you can look forward to these wonderful things as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Luke, for bringing together those many passages which the scripture has recorded that tell us of this wonderful time when the Lord Jesus is back on earth and God's kingdom is established and men and women enjoy the blessings of the kingdom age. This is something which is very exciting and as Brother Luke has shown us, this is something which we can be personally involved in 
as followers of the Lord Jesus, to be his helpers in that day to come, to help establish this time of peace and blessing upon the earth. So I hope you've enjoyed this, the last of our series of talks, and that you'll want to inquire further into the gospel message, and there will be links provided uh, underneath the video that will take you to further talks. There are many videos that are on the web that talk about the faith and the belief of the Christadelphians and reflect what the Bible has to say, because that is our criteria. We only believe those things which we can see illustrated by the word of God. This is our source of truth and comfort and hope. And we pray that you will be motivated to come and seek out more of these wonderful things. So thank you for listening.